two, one. Begin Podfix Network transmission. In three, two, one. Fly fishing in a stream, getting those ankles wet. Or deep in the ocean, casting nets. Fish nerds. Fish nerds. Fish nerds. It's a podcast. Hello and welcome to the Fish Nerds, the show about fish, fishing, and eating fish. Always interesting, usually funny, and mostly true. I'm Clay Groves, Chief Executive Fish Nerd, Licensed Fishing Guide, your best friend. Co-hosting tonight is John King, the crappie hippie. John King, how's it going? It is going fantastic, man. I'm sitting here with a cold hams in front of the microphone, looking at your handsome face. What could be better? I thought you said cold hams. I'm like, hmm, cold ham. Delicious. <laughs> cold ha- cold hams <laughs> hams the greatest beer on earth uh, hey, hey. i don't have a beer i have nothing it's just me and you john so oh, wow so this big gonna be- big fun show though we got a lot going on today on the tonight's show you've been really kind of pulling your weight and then some lately in the fish nerds hey. well you know it's what i do man it's what i do i love podcasting you, you started this craziness i'm just just you know, I know. swimming with the current buddy can, can swimming against quit. the current rather but we're gonna open up with uh fish in the news tonight we're gonna catch up with angie scott from the woman angler and adventure podcast we've got an audubon person who are we talking from audubon oh we've got the fantastic wildlife biologist laura williams with the maine audubon society and she is a big proponent of lead-free fishing, and she handles their uh, lead-free fishing program. They do a lot of lead-free fishing education, Maine Audubon mm-hmm. does. And that'll and, be the bulk uh, of she, the show tonight, too. Yeah, I, I, I scaled a little for about 10 minutes, but we got to have so much fun. It's going to be the bulk of the show, bro. Fun. And uh, and and uh, Kathy has come back on the show with doing Laura's husband, Jamie Moffitt's recipe tonight. We got a little recipe. We do, indeed. And brand new music to go with it. Woo-hoo. Yeah, the mysterious bait ma- bait <laughs> bait caster cylinder has made some music for us to go along with that. So a lot going on tonight's show, and and John, it's funny. Someone on one of the Facebook groups, like a podcasting face group group, group said, "What is the biggest problem you have with making a podcast?" And I said, "The biggest problem is there's so much content you can't get to it all. It gets too much content. The fish nerds never run out of stuff to talk about." Never, 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 never. Never. I mean, I interviewed Doc Martin. That's not making this week's show. We talked nope. about bow hunting fish and the and the science behind it. Not oh the, my goodness! Not I can't on wait this for week's show. One. I've got an interview coming up this Wednesday about panthers. We're going to learn about Florida panthers on the Fish Nerds podcast, but not this week. Sounds good. This I week, we're getting into it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> totally <laughs> into it, man. Let's, let's get into it. Why don't we jump right in, John, with some... You know what? I don't want to talk about news. I want to talk about a fishing thing I just did the other day. Okay. My first boat ride of the year. I got the boat in the water. I'm going to tell you about some boating mistakes and some driving mistakes. And Do then, it, man. Because <laughs> this is like real life guide stuff. So I got on a 24-foot pontoon boat, and we're now open for the season. My first trip was this past Friday, and it was just a boat ride. I have one client who hires me nine times a year but doesn't fish, just wants to drive around the boat real slow, which I'm happy to do. And, and so I, on Thursday, I go to start the boat, put a fresh battery in, wash the boat down, I'm ready to go, turn the key, and just click, nothing. The, no, the motor makes no sound whatsoever. All the electronics turn on, it's beeping, it's buzzing, but no motor turning. So I go through the whole thing, look for corrosion. I find this one part. It's some kind of widget. I have no idea. There's like five wires. They're all rusted out. I take it out. I call the mechanic up at the local dealership, and I say, it's about 40 minutes away. And I say, hey, can you help me troubleshoot my motor? I can't make it start. And they go, we don't help people on the phone. I said, I'm going to come in then, and you're going to help me in real life. And they go, we don't, we, don't, we don't give advice. And I said, I'm coming in. So I, I went in, and I got behind the counter with the lady behind the counter. I'm like, is this broken? And she goes, I don't give advice. We just You can bring your boat in. We'll fix it for you. Well, to have it done in two weeks. And I said, that's not good enough. There's something stupid on my boat that's making it not work. And one of the technicians leaned around the corner and he goes, is that Clay? I went, yeah. And he starts laughing and he hands me a 20 amp fuse. And he goes, under the uh, cowl on your motor, that's the cover of your outboard, there's a fuse box. Put that in there and take out the old one and it will work. And boom, sure enough, fired right up. Dollar, oh, man, dollar, and, dollar and 10 it. cents. Dollar and 10 cents. So... <laughs> So stupid. But you can't. How do you know these things? You can't you don't know. know it. You can't know everything. But he did. And he knew because of how new the boat was that it, that's all that it could be. Yeah, I didn't even hesitate. 
And they told me the other stuff I took out, never touch again, because I'll break my boat. And then <laughs> we had a fine day on the water, and I'm taking the boat out of the water. Like, we got a really steep boat launch on Lake Ossipee in New Hampshire here. And a bunch of yahoos had parked illegally, making that right-hand turn out of the boat ramp, pulling a 24-foot boat behind my big truck, really challenging. To make that sharper turn, I had to cut left a little bit and kind of arc over. And because my truck is so tall, I didn't see a post in the ground that was below eye level out, out of my field of view. I scraped a big dent into the front fender of my car and tore a hole in my door and uh, rendered, the, no. rendered my driver's side door not operable. <laughs> oh, my God. I know. Yeah. That's it. And, so, uh, yeah. Anyway, we're open, we're open well, for this season now. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Maybe not quite as shiny and new, but we are definitely ready to operate. Well, right. you know, John, it's, it's every every fishing season, whether it's winter season or summer season. I start off thinking, all right, I'm going to start making money this week. And then the first couple of trips, I lose $1,000 right off the top. Just boom, <laughs> the money's gone. Now I've got to do four trips to get to zero again, and it, it's just terrible. So my next trip is this well, week, my first fishing trip. We're doing uh, rainbow trout and salmon fishing on Silver Lake. You've been on that lake before. And we're going to catch some rainbows Gorgeous. and salmon. Yeah, so. Oof. Sounds fantastic. Well, listen, I, I I can commiserate, not quite to that extent, <laughs> but Fish Nerd Librarian Jeff Donaldson and I, we are big time buddies when it comes to fishing. And here is something that just is our cosmic uh, cost of our friendship. One of us has to lose something or break something every time we go fishing. So. I lost my action camera. It wasn't an expensive one, but they don't make them anymore. It's called a Yee Light, and they don't make them and sell them in the U.S. anymore. Oh, no. Uh, I lost all the batteries, the SD cards, everything. I somehow took it out of my backpack, and instead of putting it right back in like a smart person would, I set it down, and then Jeff caught a fish or maybe a butterfly went by. I'm easily distractible, okay? And that's mm -hmm. why I've got to be really careful anyway walked off and left it at the stream and then the next time we went fishing jeff broke a fly rod yep. and the first time we went fishing i lost a pair of sunglasses mm -hmm. so see it's just there's just certain things it, your first trip out's just got to be colorful clay it's just got to be right yeah but now but now they the shakedown's done so now we're okay you lost the money yeah, exactly the the fishing gods have been satiated with your sacrifices and now it's going to be a good season well, let's certainly hope so. All right, let's jump into the news, John. You ready for this? Let's, let's do it. Wrong button. Not wrong button. <laughs> what, what button is it? There it is. <laughs> you know, John, it is possible to label the buttons on my mixing board, but I don't. <laughs> yeah, I... Or a little chart, a little color chart. I don't know, bro. Yeah. yeah. Why don't you take the lead on the news here? All right. Well, listen, I got a couple of great stories from listener Michael Lafort, um, both Kansas oriented. And this one is going to excite all our fish nerd geeks because this one is about sturgeon. And they're so cool. Them, they are so freaking cool. And it's especially exciting to me because when I was a kid, the call, the Kansas River, had been declared the third most polluted, most dead river in the country. This was back in the day when PCBs and all these other chemicals were. Right. This predates the Clean Water Act, right? It, yes, exactly. I was a little kid driving across the bridge there in Topeka, Kansas, where I lived and looking down at the river and asking why we never go fishing there and found out it's because the thing is dead and there are just hardly any fish in it and you wouldn't want to handle or um, eat any of the fish out of it. In fact, we used to joke with people that, you know, your boat would dissolve faster than uh, you could catch a fish in there. Um, so it's fabulous to see that the river has come back. Um, you know, I read how the pioneers and the soldiers moving through Kansas would stop and net uh, walleye out of it and all this stuff. And I just plain couldn't believe it back in the day. But uh, it, the river's full of lots of sauger in there now, white bass, walleyes, even a few stripers. I mean, there's a lot of things in there. But this was so exciting because here we go. This is from KDWP, our, our outdoor, our uh, Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks Fishing Division. And they stumbled across an interesting find while conduct 
walking dunking, which is <laughs> when you take a donut that's fish flavored and dunk it. No, dunk but it. while conducting a sampling, they were sampling uh, some fish and so forth, uh, trying to get some ideas on how to remove the invasive carp that are in the call. And they came across a rare pallid sturgeon. Now, these sturgeon are listed both federally and in Kansas as endangered species. And we all know sturgeon live a long time. Well, this sturgeon bore tags and markings indicated that it had been handled by biologists on the Missouri River in 2011. Um, pallid sturgeons are very, very uncommon in Kansas. And uh, there's a lot of efforts to improve their populations all throughout the Mississippi River Basin. Um, but this is a wonderful and very rare find. Uh, I'd always known that there were shovel nose sturgeons in the river and had seen some catches of shovel nose, but they're kind of a small sturgeon, whereas the pallid sturgeon can grow up to six feet long. A shovel nose, uh, a huge one would be about 30 inches. So anyway, absolutely exciting to see yet another fish that used to swim the call back in the call. We've got the pallid sturgeon there. They've never been overly common in the call, but at least they're there. It's and exciting. It is very exciting to me. So. You know what's neat about it, John, is the fact that it was already seen by another scientist before. And to see I know it kind of come up in the records again. It kind of really, that's some good data right there. It's, it's, uh, I, well, well, it's fish nerd excitement like no other. Mm -hmm. I, I was really, 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 really pleased. Now, my next story is going to hit closer to home. And this also sent in by Michael. But we got a new crappie record in Kansas, everybody. Woo. Yes, indeed. And it is a fabulous story. A Kansas State fishing record that held strong for almost 60 years was broken by Bobby Parkhurst of Topeka when he set a new Kansas record for white crappie, catching a giant 4.07 pound fish, breaking the, re breaking the previous record of 4.02 pounds set in 1964 it's a long the record, record crop wow yeah almost 60 years i mean this is fabulous and out of sight uh the record crappie measured 18 inches long with a 14 inch girth and parker's caught this enormous slab in potawatomi state fishing lake number two which is out west towards manhattan where i went to school no kidding now these lakes are not like the, the ponds where they artificially grow large fish these are public lakes or like just normal lakes. These are normal lakes. Actually, they are heavily fished lakes. Okay, That's great. what is so exciting. That's what Bobby I was checking just, on. Because, you know, you see these, like, uh, bluegill monsters, but they're, like, specially, like, lab-grown almost in these, like, specific ponds where they move them from one pond to the next every few months to get that right growth out of them. But this is a wild fish. This is a wild fish from a uh, fishery that is maintained, but basically just stocked and... A lot of people fish there just for fun, but, uh, you know, this is a lake where a half, you know, stringer for a little 10, 10, 11 inch crappie is a real big deal. Well, Bobby's just out there drowning a few minnows. And the next thing you know, well, well, let's put it in Bobby's words. He says, when I hooked it, it had some weight to it. I felt it had some weight to it. And I actually thought it was a walleye at first, but when I saw it, I quit reeling and started walking to the bank, you know, just like a kid drag it up because I'm telling you. A lot of times you keep reeling on those big ones. Mm -hmm. They come to the top, smile at you, and then down they go without the hook in their mouth. Yep, you don't and want that, that that flip on the surface. That's when you lose your fish. So if you can drag it to the beach, that's a win. Exactly. And, and of course, crappie, they're always kind of a tenuous hookup anyway because their mouth is, they're called a paper mouth for a reason. And uh, so they are real easy to lose. And uh, it, it took... Uh, he caught the fish actually on March 5th, but it takes a month to get the cer uh, certification. Biologist uh, John Rinke, assistant director of the Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks, was in charge of it. He weighed it on the certified scale and so on. Um, but what's crazy about this, Clay, is look at the margin. Look at the margin. I mean, without technology, are we going to be able to get a record fish that's five one hundredths of an ounce bigger than the previous record? Well, you always wonder too, like with a 1960s record, how accurate was that? Right. You know, because you're comparing things 40 years apart and the technology then was different than now. So yeah, it'll be interesting. You're going to start seeing records that are closer and closer and people double checking stuff too with all the cheating going on these days. So absolutely, absolutely. It's going yeah. to have to. Now here's uh, really the sad be. thing about it, John. And I think it's probably true. Most places that in order to get a record fish, you have to kill a fish. I know, I know. We talk about that, but yeah. you know what? I don't know. I, I'm, 
I we're gonna have we got a picture. I, I put it in the file. You can put it in the show notes if you want. It's it's a slob of a crappie. It's kind of crazy looking to imagine such a thing. Yeah. Well, I have but you know what else? But but I'm with you. Oh. I think it's cool. But I would. I you know if I had a state record, John, I would kill the fish. Even though I, I judge from the side of not having a record, where I'm like, oh, I don't bother killing that fish. But when I get the record fish, I'm gonna kill it. <laughs> well, <laughs> so. I I don't think I am just because I'm kind of lazy and kind of past that and kind of just don't want to run around looking for a, a biologist to certify it. It's that. a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Now, last summer, my niece caught what would have been the state record pumpkin seed here in New Hampshire. Would have beaten Mike Steffen, longtime listener, friend of the show, his record. Uh, but she wanted to let it go. And it was almost 11 inches, and his was 10 and a quarter. And it was a much bigger fish. Wow. So, yeah, but she chose, you know, niceness over ego. I would have gone the other way. <laughs> I would have gone the other way just to rub it in his face that a six year old beat his record. <laughs> well, good for her, bless her heart. What a sweetie. I, I tell you, I just uh, yeah, the 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 whole thing. See, back in the day when I was young and competitive and you know, wanted my big story every day at school and so forth, we used to go for the old um, field and stream badges that you could get. And oh, you had I to have that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and a witness scale and all that. And there were a couple of stores that had to put up with us walking through the store in our fishing clothes, dripping fish all the way back to the meat department where there were some guys that were fishers, so they were pretty cool with, hey, you know, mm -hmm. go ahead. We can weigh it for you. We'll sign the card and all that for you. But any more of those kind of maybe it's just I'm getting old clay. I don't know what it is, but I just kind of catch them and let them go unless I've got uh, big culinary plans. Right. Well, but New Hampshire has a catch and release trophy program. And so you catch a fish in a certain length, all you need is a photo of the fish being handled gently with the water body and the angler in the same photo, send it in, they send you a patch, and you get in the record books for your, by length only. The only problem with that is, even though there's, I think, 15 fish on the list, there's only one patch. So you would end up getting the same repeating patch over and over again. If they had a patch for each species, you'd have people chasing the collection. Yeah, true. Got to get them all. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. It's fun to collect. So, it is always fun to collect. I'll tell you though, like my collection of those field and stream pins and my, my uh, Manitoba trophy pin for a smallmouth and all this stuff. I came across them once, said, Wow, this is cool. You know, I used to have them hanging up in my mm -hmm. room and all that. But now I've came across them in a drawer and then I can't even remember what drawer. I don't know where they're at. So, uh, it's so sad, John. You know, what's, what's important? in one part of your life, maybe not so much later, but let me give you one more fact and we can move on. Um, I just found out from this article that crappie is now the second most popular game fish in the USA trailing only the large mouth bass. I love crappie. So sorry, fishing. trout, but you're <laughs> down in third place and crappie is coming up, baby. Crappie for the win. Crappie for the win. Crappie for the win. All right. All right, John, I got a story here about death. <laughs> oh my goodness i know this is from cnn it was sent in by tim beat tim Tacklebox beat tim Tacklebox beat i thought he wasn't with us anymore i'm so glad he's still still thinking of us miss that tim all right let's talk about this uh this is about puffer fish so even our our friend greg the uh knitting dad would be excited about this story <laughs> <laughs> but an elderly couple just died after eating poisonous puffer fish in malaysia prompting an appeal from their daughter for stronger laws to prevent others from suffering the same fate. Now, they're both old. They're both in the 80s. And they unknowingly bought two pufferfish from an online vendor in, on March 25th in a southern state called uh, Johor. Never heard of it. And that same day, they fried the fish for lunch and began having breathing difficulties and shivers. Both of them uh, suffered from this stuff and were rushed to the hospital and both died by 7 p.m. the same day. So, well, actually, one oh. died. Oh, sorry, it's not true. One was pronounced dead the same day. The other one fell into a coma for eight days and then a condition worth and he died on Saturday. So it took him eight days to die from that. One died right away. So that's really awful. It, now, it's horrible. I, I feel bad for laughing. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, now, Malaysian, the, the, the daughter's asking for tougher laws. It's already illegal to sell these poisonous and harmful food like pufferfish meat. And the offense carries a fine of about $2,300 and up to two years in prison for selling it. But, Golly, but what, I, what if it leads to a death? I, maybe I hope it's a little stiffer. Well, anyway, <laughs> despite the dangers, pufferfish are sold in Malaysia at wet markets. 
and it's exotic, and the trend attracts consumers. Now, I was watching John Wick 3 last night. John Wick movies are very popular right now. Wick 4 is in the theaters. And the villain flies to, I, th- I don't know, what, what, it must be Malaysia, some wet market, and eats puffer fish to try to look tough. Doesn't hesitate. Did so, he survive? She survived, yeah. It was no big deal to her because she's badass. I see. But, <laughs> as if you can be a badass and will away poison. Yeah, of that, of that. What's that poison called? I mean, it sounds like it's really powerful. It is, and it, it is. And here's the, before I get into what the name of the toxin is, um, this food is called fugu in Japanese. That's a term for puffer fish. Okay. And it's highly okay. priced despite the poison. The fish's organs, skin, blood, and bones all con- contain high, high concentrations of the poison. It's called tetrodotoxin. Tetrodotoxin. And ingesting it can, me- can really mess you up. Now, interestingly, when I've eaten poisonous fish, the only poisonous fish I've ever eaten is a margined mad tom. And it wasn't poisonous, it was venomous. And that's the difference. If you okay. eat, eat a venomous animal, when you cook it, the proteins cook out the venom. So you don't have to worry about it. But poisonous is a whole other game. And you want to avoid, don't eat poisonous things. The, and you know what the thing about, John? Most exotic foods, when, I, when you really look at why people eat them, it's 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 a very like I I, I mean it's going to sound sexist. It's a very like masculine thing. It's usually a absolutely dude, usually a dude, and it's usually to make his man parts work better. <laughs> yeah, it, almost yeah. always. Look at shark fins. Look at tusks. Look at any those kind of rare things that people are grinding up into a dust to add to their foods. It's all about making their man parts work better. Well, so. I'll tell you, I remember when the sushi thing came on strong and the fugu thing came on strong. I think the actual term in Japanese is basically translates as fugu me. So you're yep. sitting there with your business man friends and yeah, you want to show that you're a tough macho guy that's willing to take dares. Mm-hmm. You go fugu me and the chef runs off and makes some of that for you. They even did a Simpsons on it, which is one of my favorites, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, no, thank you. I'm I am out on this stuff, but it, it is still popular. Me too. It's going to stay popular for a long time because people are funny about stuff like that. And I don't care like what culture you're from. Every culture has their stupid, and this is I think this is one of their stupids. <laughs> so yeah, every culture has their stupid. We put it on TV in this country. Mm-hmm. Hey, look, I'm going to pour lighter fluid on my shirt and set oh, it on fire. Have you, you know, seen yeah. Japanese game shows? I've only seen parodies of Japanese games. Well, shows. they're every bit as crazy as you would imagine. So, yeah. But there it is. Fugu. Don't do it. That's my advice. Yeah, that's so, right. Some things just aren't edible. And eating things just to be to show off or for the thrill of it, I don't want a thrill with eating. I want comfort and joy. I hear you, brother. Yeah. I hear you loud and clear. All right. That wraps up our news, John. I'm going to push the button. No. <laughs> Woo, man! One of these days, John, I'm going to figure this job out and I'll be a hero. Yes, you will be a hero. One of these days, you will be a bigger <laughs> our, hero. Our listeners will be like, "Man, that Clay he sounds good." All of a sudden, what happened to him? <laughs> He's gone to really podcasting together. college. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we get to the meat of today's show? Let's do it. You know something, brother? I've been missing our friend Angie Scott. You've been missing Angie Scott. I've been following her on Facebook. So I feel like I'm with her in spirit. Exactly, exactly, exactly. I, I get back and forth with her, but there uh, we usually communicate quite frequently. But we're both so darn busy anymore. It, it's not like it used to be. But what do you say we catch up a little with Angie Scott? Let's get after it. All right. Well, listen for the fish nerds that do not know who Angie Scott is. She has appeared on our show a couple of times. She is the creator, producer, and host of the Woman Angler and Adventurer podcast, and she is also an avid bass tournament fisher, and that's what I wanted to talk to her about, so sit tight, and let's catch up with Angie Scott and see what she's been up to. All right. Hey, Angie, is that you there? It is. Hey, John. Wow. Wow. It's been too long, too long. It has been. Well, listen... I just wanted to catch up with you because our listeners love you and I love you. And we're just, you know, you're my sister from another mister. And <laughs> I got to know what's going on with you. I saw on the Facebook that you're down at Chickamauga, which is a reservoir on the Tennessee River, I do believe. Yes, it is. 
and you're fishing in a tournament with two chicks in a boat fishing league. And I want to talk about that, but before we get going, let's, let's talk about the important news, which is the new addition to the Scott family. <laughs> That's right. We've got a rambunctious little five, soon to be six month old puppy. And uh, she's been traveling with us. We actually picked her up at six weeks old, got in the car and, uh, and well, the truck, I should say, in the camper and drove all the way down to Florida the day we got her. So she, all she's known is life on the road. Well, then she's a true Scott because she, you know, <laughs> yes, that's, that's right. the life right now, isn't it? <laughs> yep. And she's, she's back in the camper now, just like she never left. So, um, but she's a good, she's a smart dog. She's a golden doodle. She's probably going to be pretty big. So we may have to make some adjustments down the road, but, uh, right now we're making it work. She's a golden doodle. Wow. That's, that's really cool. Now what's her name again? We named her Lakeland beautiful lake so we thought that was pretty fitting lakeland lakeland yeah. it is beautiful lake what a sweetheart i see she's already been out on the boat she's been doing this yep. she's been doing that you're gonna raise her to be a good fish dog and that is fantastic that's the goal yeah she loves we can already tell she's gonna be a water dog so we'll see if we'll be able to keep her in the boat <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, yeah i know dogs like that too <laughs> yeah <laughs> well good luck good luck i know you're you're pretty much uh, able to handle anything so you'll get her trained up that oh yeah there's a time for swimming and there's a time for fishing that's right all right now chickamauga two chicks in a boat talk to me about it angie yeah so this is a brand new tournament trail that two chicks in a boat Lori povacil and Beth Mills started just uh, not too long ago. Um, they had just had a vision to provide a platform for women that are wanting to fish with other ladies in a team tournament uh, setting, which uh, is my background. That's us. That's how I started fishing tournaments was on uh, the team Nashville Bassmasters. Um, but all my partners were guys. And so uh, I love the idea of having a women's team trail option and uh, they're kind of doing a different region. They're, they're kind of focusing a little bit more on, I don't know if you call it the Midwest. Um, I don't know what, what region you call it, but, but this year for the first season, they're doing Chickamauga. So this is the very, very first trail stop of, you know, the, the beginning of the whole deal. So, and then, uh, they're doing a, a lake in Ohio, uh, one in Virginia, and one in Indiana. So four, four trail stops uh, this season, and uh, just kind of getting their feet wet and seeing how it goes. I'm actually, I just decided to fish this one because it's so close, and uh, you know, had a a little bit of break, so I'm like, well, I can make it work with the schedule. I'll go check it out. I actually have not even met my partner. Um, I think it's a lady from Ohio that's come down that wanted to be a co-angler, but just didn't have a, a boater to team up with. So I said, hey, I'll take her out with me and we'll see what happens. Well, what a lucky gal. So it's kind of like you're in the mid, in the mid, you're having a couple in the mid south and you're having a yeah. couple in the Midwest. So that's, that's right. pretty, pretty, pretty cool. So I'm excited for you to meet this person because she is in for a treat. Because tell us all what kind of boat she's going to be stepping on to. Yeah, so this year I'm running a Crestliner MX-19 aluminum bass boat. And I've only fished one tournament out of it so far. That was the Lady Bass Anglers tournament down on Lake Palestine. And uh, literally I just got the boat, went down to Dallas. And I, I'm absolutely in love with it. It's such a perfect platform for me. Um, it's, uh, got a huge deck, tons of storage, um, and, you know, aluminum being so lightweight, I can get it in. I had it in inches of water down on Lake Palestine and had no worries whatsoever. So that's kind of my style of fishing is get it as shallow as I can. And, uh, it's probably going to be the same thing out here on Chick right now being, getting into spring. So, yeah, we'll see. I was hoping to get out and practice fish with it some tomorrow, but they're calling for uh, 
wind advisories pretty much all day, some pretty strong wind gusts. So I might just have to fish this one blind. I haven't been on Chick since 2019 and I was a co-angler, so I really don't remember much about it. I think we were in Harrison Bay, which isn't too far from here. But other than that, I, re I really have no clue. So it's a, it might be an interesting day on Sunday. Tell me the boat again, because I think the internet cut out just a little bit. Oh, okay. I want listeners be able to hear the exact model of boat that you got, because I'm so turned on about the thing, just looking at pictures of it. I think it needs <laughs> to be in a, in a Marvel superhero movie. Yeah, um, well, it's a, it's a Crestliner MX-19 aluminum bass boat. MX-19. See, that's just awesome. You know, it, it just, <laughs> it, it is. Angie and her MX-19 just out there. I love the finish. I love the look. I love the decks i just love the whole setup and yeah. you did that demo on how much storage it has that just blew my mind that is <laughs> incredible nice. yeah and i've you know just the two tournaments i've had it down at you know, like palestine we got tons of compliments from people they were just like oh my gosh i love the look of this boat um it looked it's perfect what more could you possibly need and even today as we were setting up camp, a gentleman pulled over and he was like, can I take a picture of your boat? That's the most beautiful boat I've ever seen. <laughs> so it's definitely a looker, but um, it's also super functional. And yeah, I'm, I'm still trying to wrap my head around all the storage. Well, looks and function. You, you can't get better than that. I know that oh. in quite a few people. And I know that in a boat when I see it and you are set up the way you ought to be. And I am really, really tickled. All right. Well, two chicks in a boat and hopefully we get back and we'll hear how all that went That Chickamauga. That's, that's big old, big old, big old reservoir. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So I'm planning on just kind of dialing it down, focusing either right here where I'm staying at Chester Frost. Um, there, it's, uh, kind of a well-known area to hold a lot of big bass, um, which also means it gets a lot of pressure. So that can kind of be a detriment um, or where we're taking out of, um, in Saudi Daisy, probably right there where we're, you know, close by the ramp where we're launching is, um, plenty of spotted bass to be caught. So we'll see. We will see. That's always, that's the excitement, isn't it? The unknown. Yep. We'll see. All right. Well, another thing that made me want to get in touch with you is I'm, I'm looking and you got to go to some sort of big deal bass tournament. You know, I'm not into that sort of stuff. I, that Chickamauga, I'd be hunting them crappie and you're like, what's wrong with you? And that's okay. <laughs> but, uh, tell us what is it? Bass classic bass master classic classic bass people. But anyway, you were down there for St. Croix rods who yep. you pro for, and you were running a booth for them. But I, I saw you had quite the interview list. You got to run around and, the look on your face was like a kid in a candy store. I mean, you've been <laughs> smiling from ear to ear, meeting all these pros that you you follow. And uh, fill us in on that one. Yeah, so the Bassmaster Classic this year was taking place in Knoxville, Tennessee. I had to miss it the last couple of years because it conflicted with our Lady Bass Anglers tournaments in March. And so I was really excited knowing it was going to be in Knoxville, so close to be able to get back there. Um, I got to go. My last one was in Birmingham in 2020, but my first ever Bassmaster Classic was in 2019 when it was in Knoxville. So it was kind of cool to come full circle and be back in Knoxville. And I, you know, being my third classic, I kind of knew how everything worked. And I was there mainly representing the Woman Angler and Adventure podcast as media, but I also got to uh, partner up with St. Croix Rods and do some work with them at their space at the expo. But uh, as media, you get to kind of plan some anglers that you want to meet with on media day. And so I picked some of my favorites out to uh, chat with. So that's why I was so excited just to chat with some of my favorite pros. Um, unfortunately, I had uh, Jeff Gustafson as my first interview of the day very first interview for Jeff. And for some reason, when I got there, somebody else was already talking to him and uh, you only get 10 minute slots with each angler. So I didn't want to risk messing up the rest of my schedule. And then of course, Gussie went on to win the Bassmaster Classic. So it's kind of <laughs> oh. unfortunate that I got had to miss that opportunity to chat with him. But uh, I was excited to talk with uh, Carl Jockinson, who we kind of bond over the fact that we both travel in a Lance truck camper. 
Um, John Cox, who runs the Crestliner MX-21. So it was great to chat with him. And he's actually getting an MX-19 this summer to run around in down in Florida. And he's su- he's super excited about that. Uh, talk about a kid in a candy store talking to him about these uh, Crestliner boats. And then, uh, and then, of course, my my buddy Gerald Swindle. Uh, it was so much fun chatting with him as well. And we talked a lot about music, which that's always seems to be a top of of conversation with us. So great time down there in Knoxville. Sounds like fantastic. I know G Man is one of your favorites. That's right, right? G Man. I'm, yep. I'm yeah. Yep. All right. All righty. <laughs> Anyhow, I know he's one of your favorite folks that's out there fishing and doing it. And I've heard your interviews with him. So it's really great you guys got to hook up again and do some chatting and do some have some fun. Well, Angie, it's just been really, really good talking to you. I don't know if you've got anything else you want to talk about, anything going on. Sure. Oh, oh, one thing I was going to ask is, what does it take to make the cut with Angie Scott? You're you're picking out people to interview. You know, I can see like you and Gerald have that music connection, but I want this from a lady's POV. What kind of things makes a pro someone you want to talk to? Um, well, for me, just having some kind of connection or something in common. I mean, in my experience, all of all of the pros are really all around great people. Um, so that would probably be a, a number one thing. You know, if somebody's out there and is just a jerk. I'm probably not going to have much <laughs> interest in in chasing them down and having a conversation. But everybody I've observed so far, um, you know, seems like class acts i mean if you make it to that level i already know just from the small level that i fish on how much it takes just to compete in a tournament you know with all the work that goes into it and the travel and the money um but i always look for just something you know even if it's just a small thing that we can kind of connect over and um you know that just makes having a conversation with them a little more personal and, and, uh, special. Well, it just sounds all right to me. I'm glad you're getting to meet some people that inspire you and some people that are inspired by you and, uh, you know, filling us in because we're all aware of the tournament thing and I understand the thrill. It's just one of those things kind of like, I understand the thrill of skydiving, but you ain't getting me up in no airplane and pushing me out the door. (laughs) That ain't going to happen. So it's awesome to talk to you. And um, let me just give you a few minutes here at the end to uh, sound off about anything else you want to talk to, anything that's on your mind. Yeah, so just looking forward to the rest of 2023. We have some exciting stuff coming up, a lot of travel. And uh, a couple highlights I want to mention. Um, One is uh, in July. I don't have everything set yet, but I'm hoping that ICAST does the ICAST Cup again this year. And uh, if so, I plan to bring the Crestliner down and compete in that on Lake Toho. So that would be uh, quite a unique and fun experience if we get a chance to do that. Um, and then uh, and then again, always the goal to try to qualify for the Lady Bass Anglers Association Classic, which this year it's back on Bull Shoals Lake. Uh, which we fished uh, last year, but not in the classic. It was a totally different time of year. So I'm excited to get back down to Bull Shoals if I can qualify. And it will be a totally different lake than when we were there. So that's just another thing I'm really looking forward to. And then, of course, uh, back down to Florida again for another winter season. We extended it this year, so we're planning to be down there November 1st through uh, the end of March. And, uh, you know, getting, getting to do some more inshore and freshwater fishing while we're down in Florida. Well, that all sounds so fantastic, but I'm, a, I'm feeling a little pain here. I'm feeling a little hurt here. Um, <laughs> what about Truman? What about oh, yeah, the fact course. that crappie hippie is going to come down to Truman Lake? So that is, you? I thought you probably... might be looking forward to that. Yeah, I'm look, but, I'm looking forward to that part of it, but I still have a kind of a bad place in my uh, memory from my first experience on Truman oh, yeah. <laughs> when the weather was about as bad as it could possibly get. 
Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I remember <laughs> hopefully the story. it regains itself this this time around. And um, man, to meet you in person finally, that will be uh, pretty awesome. It will be awesome. And I know you're awful busy during those tournaments. So even if we can only manage a fish bump, uh, I mean, a, a fish bump, that's how you <laughs> say you fist, fist bump <laughs> in fish and talk. Uh, <laughs> even if we only manage that, that is going to be all right. I can't wait. Uh, but anyway, fantastic, fantastic. Yeah, I remember last time you were at, at Truman and you were talking about having to go to Walmart and get yourself some clothes and some yep. stuff. <laughs> and uh-huh. and uh, hand warmers. Yeah, and then uh, washing uh, the waves come up and being wondering if the, the boat you were in the, the one day was going to make it back to shore and all that. Yeah, quite the adventure. Let's hope it'll be a little more kind to you. In fact, let's hope it even overdoes its generosity and sets you up with a bass. Let me say in the eight pound range somewhere hey, in there. I'll take it. <laughs> Think so? Anything. All right. All right. <laughs> well, fantastic, Angie. It's always great to talk to you. I know our listeners are excited to hear from you and catch up with you. But uh, I'm going to let you go. I know you got you and Dana, you got your evening to have and you've gotten all set up and cozy in the Lance camper and I'm going to leave you to it. So thanks one more time and we will talk to you soon. Thanks for having me back on. All right. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Angie Scott. That was cool. You know, and John, I, I have to talk to Angie because she figured out how to get this camper all wrapped up with her podcast logo on it and paid for by other people. And I've never yeah. figured out sponsorships. So I need to find someone like, I need an Angie to be my best friend, to teach me some stuff. Well, I'll tell you what, I she is going to be fishing a tournament down at Truman Reservoir, which is about two hours from my place. And I am going to do my level best to get on down there and interview her and some of her friends. And I will put that to her. But yeah, she is a go-getter extreme. She is that smart girl. She's the smart kid, the smart girl in school that made the great grades. Uh, she is so personable and so likable she has gotten all kinds of she has a boat that's sponsored she has a camper that's sponsored she has uh she f- throws saint croix rods and all kinds of stuff everybody likes her everybody wants her using their stuff and uh yeah you better get next to her brother because she can teach you a lot she can she sure can hey john i think it's i think i'm hungry and i think we need to talk about you have a cooking segment here with uh kathy doing laura's husband Jamie Moffat's recipe. Who's Laura and who's Jamie Moffat? Well, Laura is Laura Williams, and she is a wildlife biologist with the Maine Audubon Society. And her husband, Chef Jamie Moffat, is the head chef at the Canopy Hotel in Portland, Maine. And he is the head chef of the Salt Yard Restaurant, which is their main restaurant, and also for Luna, which is their rooftop bar and restaurant. And he sent us in, I think at Laura's prompting, uh, sent us in a nice recipe to put on the True Bass show. But we yak so much about fishing, we didn't have time to put it on. But I thought it'd be real cute since Laura and her husband sent us in this recipe for crappie hippie and his wife to talk about it. So we did, a, we cooked it up in our own way. And we talked about the difference between the way we did it and the way chef moffat does it and it's a wonderful recipe and you're really going to enjoy it Mm. and we will have the recipe down in the show notes but right now listen to crappie hippie and his wife kathy tell you about how we did this recipe up i'm going to preempt it too by saying we got some brand new music for our food segment by the mysterious bait master (laughs) by the mysterious bait caster cylinder so you're going to hear that here right now what are you gonna do Will you grill it? Will you block it in the skillet? We gotta make it delicious So it's not for naught Let's take a look at ways to cook it In the Fish Nerds Culinary Corner All right, Kathy, we had a lot of fun over the weekend and we made a very special recipe in our own way. Uh, we got an email from Chef Jamie Moffat of the Salt Yard Restaurant and the Luna Rooftop Bar and Restaurant in the Canopy Hotel in Portland, Maine. He was kind enough to send us in a recipe for our True Bass show last week. We didn't get it on the show, but we're going to bring it to everybody now. Uh, would you go ahead and read that off for everybody, his uh, recipe, and, and then we'll go from there. Thanks, John. Jamie's recipe is for miso glazed striped bass. 
It starts out with two six to eight ounce portions of striped bass, skin on with the scales and bones removed. One fourth cup of white miso paste, one fourth cup of maple syrup, and this is the real maple syrup from trees, and one tablespoon high quality Dijon or whole grain mustard. Preheat the oven to 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Put a cast iron or heavy bottom skillet on medium heat and let preheat for two minutes. While the pan heats, pat fish dry and season all over with salt and pepper. Once the pan is hot, add one tablespoon of high heat oil, which could be canola, grapeseed, or avocado, and coat the bottom of the pan with that. Add fish to the oiled pan, skin side down, and cook on medium-high heat until the, si the skin is crispy, approximately three to five minutes. Flip fish gently and finish in the oven for two to four minutes or until fish is cooked mostly through. Then remove the pan from the oven and begin to brush the miso mixture on the fish. Coat well and place back in oven for one minute to set the glaze. Repeat at least one more time with the glazing, and then remove the fish from the pan and enjoy. Boy, that sounds fantastic. We had to do a few things different when we made it for a variety of reasons. And I thought we could kind of sit here and go back and forth, uh, talk about some of the changes we had to make. When I look at Chef Moffat's recipe, I'm seeing he's using a nice thick piece of fish, probably around an inch thick. He's got to put it in that skillet, put it in that oven. He needs a lot of air to get um, the evaporation going so that he'll get that crispy skin and so that the moisture will go out of the and turn you know what is ostensibly a sauce into a glaze and coat the fish in a nice coating like that but we didn't have all those options we kind of had to wing it what were some of the things that we were up against well first off john caught the fish in our pond and they were white bass black bass black bass pardon me and so the fillets, they were smaller fish, and the fillets were not nearly that thick, probably at the most um, a quarter to three-eighths of an inch thick. So what? You're saying I can't catch big fish? No, but we... What, are you saying I'm not a back. man? What are you saying? I'm a loser? We don't like to harvest big fish from the pond. All right, that's true. See, isn't she nice? Bass. Okay. All right. I feel okay. I, I'm, 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 I'm validated again. I'm, I'm fine. Let's proceed. We're trying to be responsible with our pond. Yes, we are trying to be responsible with the, with the harvest in the pond. All righty. So I got, I caught some nice little hammer handle bass for this recipe. It's early in the season, yeah, and I wanted to just, just harvest some of the little males that are kind of diddling around, which is what I did. Okay. So our fish were a lot smaller than Jamie's. What else? Well. We decided that we wanted to use just a heavy cookie sheet, uh, so we preheated that in the oven at the same 400 degrees Fahrenheit until that was nice and hot, and then we used a combination of foil and parchment on top of that because, unfortunately, we are big on easy cleanup, so we didn't want to have to scrub any pan. So we put the oil directly on top of the parchment, and then put the fish skin side down and followed the recipe basically the same after that. Exactly, exactly. And the thing is, yeah, we're both entrepreneurs. We're both just working all the time, all the time, all the time. So as much as we'd like to uh, do things a certain way, we're usually really tired around dinner time and we want something that you know cooks off all at once and, and is easy to clean up. So I ran into a few problems. First of all, then they were not unanticipated issues. I, I knew we, you know, our pan was going to be a little too crowded to get the evaporation. Um, I knew that the fish was going to be a little cook a little too rapidly in order to set the glaze. But when you made up the glaze, I took a little taste and it was so darn good. I didn't care if it came out more like a sauce, more like a glaze. Although parts of the fish did manage to, to dry out and glaze, and of course there was some some real sticky, nice glaze on the tray that I tasted. And, and, and when it does reduce down and condense down like that, it's even better. It, it has that caramelization. It has exactly, uh, I can see where Chef Jamie was going after it with that. It's absolutely wonderful. So 
couldn't lose the moisture, this and that. But what did you think? What did you think of the final result? I thought it was really, really yummy, very tasty dish, an unusual, you know, a different flavor than what you're used to. So it was very unique and uh, just a lovely meal. Um, I did want to mention that we had a just an extremely hard time finding the miso paste. Ah, Kansas. <laughs> But we couldn't find tortillas in Massachusetts. So I, anyway, it, I think yeah. it's just... <laughs> so what the store had... We even went to an Asian store, and the day before, somebody had come in and purchased all of the miso they had, which in that case was even instant. So anyway, at the what, grocery people store... People in eastern Kansas are hoarding miso? I guess is, is somebody this something? is. Maybe we should go get in on this. So at our store... What I was able to find was actually a white miso shiitake mushroom and chive soup base. So how'd you handle that one? So we took a sifter, metal sifter, and got all of the mushroom and chive out. And that left us with the miso powder. And then I added hot water. And it was a little thinner than I think the paste would have been. So when I was done mixing up the three ingredients for the glaze, I went ahead and cooked it down a little bit in a saucepan. That came out spectacular. It was just absolutely wonderful. There wasn't a problem with using the powder. Uh, we did make sure and, and take the other ingredients out so that it would be more to a true miso flavor. But I can't wait to try it with the actual paste. Oh, and something just occurred to me. Uh, if you really want to get close to Chef Moffat's recipe, another way to cook it. What's what's a good cooking method that's hot and dry and leaves a lot of room for evaporation? Grilling. Yes, grilling. You listening to me, Donald Colette? You're hearing me out there, brother. I know that a lot of the fish nerds love to grill, and a grill is a great way to do a glazed fish dish because you can get the crispiness. You're, you've got all that room. It's, it, you know, to dissipate the heat. Uh, you've got, you can really adjust the heat by moving the fish around and so forth. So don't forget about... If you don't have a skillet or you don't want to cook Chef Jamie's recipe in a pan, take it outside, throw it on the grill. It's got to be fantastic. Okay, so ours came out really, really well. There's some things I'm going to do a little differently next time, but I'm definitely trying this again. We have a crazy thing we want to try doing with it. What do we want to do? Well, since I cooked the glaze down, uh, we could cook it down a little further to make more of like a dipping sauce. And we thought that would be delicious with say fish, it, say fish, it, <laughs> fish sticks. But we only get the solid fish, fish, fish sticks, not the minced fish, fish sticks. So we're kind of picky about our fish sticks. Well, fish sticks without the air quotes. Yes, I mean it. I might even brush some glaze on them. I mean, this is really that good, folks. It really is. And of course, use that real maple syrup. It's absolutely uh, essential. Okay, what does Chef Moffat put on the side of his? Well, he uses uh, either fingerling potatoes or... Well, he recommends fingerling potatoes and what else? Baby Yukon Gold. Oh, the Baby Yukons. Ah, yes. But what we did is we always get uh, Yukon Gold potatoes and then we just cut them down. And we like, we've like we started cutting them down into smaller cubes and it cooks faster and makes them crispier. And then he also recommended either asparagus or broccolini. And we had Brussels sprouts, so that's what we used. Yeah, we used the Brussels sprouts. So we cubed up some regular Yukon Gold potatoes, roasted them, and then about, uh, you know, just as they're just barely starting to get tender, uh, these broccoli, I mean not broccoli, these Brussels sprouts were big, so I had to quarter them. You know, you know the story. If they're little tiny ones, leave them whole. If they're so, you know a little bit bigger, go ahead and cut them in half. But these were like mini cabbage heads, so I had, I had to quarter these up. Anyway, the whole thing was absolutely delicious. It's a perfect side for this, but really, when it comes to fish, asparagus, roast potatoes, roast vegetables, whatever you have, it's, it's a great accompaniment to so many things, including fish, and it was an absolute delight. And you tossed the potatoes in olive oil. Yes. Roasted those for about yes, 10 just till the, to 15 yeah, minutes. just till they started then going. Then added the Brussels sprouts. Right, and then it also had a little oil. And cooked that off and then put the salt and pepper on after they were out of the oven. That's how I like to do it. Yeah, I like to S&P, make sure they're still you know blazing hot coming out of that oven. Then you put the salt and pepper on. You can stick it back in if you need to. But 
Uh, that's that's our way of doing it. And once again, it's easy. It's easy cleanup. It's, because we use the foil. Because we use the foil in the parchment. So sometimes you feel a little guilty, but you can't concede your whole life plan to the to your micro environment. We we compost. We we go without zip bags. We do all kinds of stuff. But when it comes to being exhausted and just get something good to eat. Uh, we got to do that easy cleanup method. I've described this before on the show. So, but we always reuse the foil and yes, the indeed. parchment. Parchment, so. if we can, yes, indeed, always. All right. So, one last thank you to Chef Jamie Moffat from the Salt Yard Restaurant and the Luna Restaurant Roof Tarp Roof Tarp Carp No Loof Carp Roof Loof Loof Carp Luna Luna is the moon. And you go up to the roof, and there's a restaurant bar up there in the Canopy Hotel in Portland, Maine. Uh, thank you so much, Chef Jamie Moffat, for sending this in. Chef Jamie Moffat happens to be the husband of our guest, Laura Williams, from the Maine Audubon Society. And she twisted his arm and put him up to this, and we sure appreciate her uh, pushing him our direction because uh, this is a great recipe, and I want you all to try it. Anything else, Kev? Um, I can't think of anything else. <laughs> I think you've said it all. Oh, my goodness. I've said it all. Well, I guess it's time to go then. This is Crappie Hippie, your tree-hugging redneck from eastern Kansas with a recipe from Chef Jamie Moffat of the Salt Yard Restaurant in the Canopy Hotel in Portland, Maine, with my beautiful wife, Kathy, saying tight lines and valentines. Peace out and my shabby booth. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Did that sound good or what? Made me hungry. I can eat that while you listen to the next interview. There you go. Yeah, be perfect. Well, the interview we have coming up is with Laura Williams, wildlife biologist, and please sit down and give a listen. She's going to talk about what she does with the Maine Audubon Society, and she runs their fishing, their lead-free fishing education program with some help from other staffers, and uh, we sat down and had a wonderful conversation about lead-free fishing. Check it out. Hello, Fish Nerd Nation. This is Crappie Hippie here, your tree-hugging redneck from eastern Kansas. And I'm sitting here in Glasswater headquarters this morning, just as excited as I can be. Because over Zoom, I have a guest for us that you're going to just want to sit down and listen to all the way through. Her name is Laura Williams, and she is a biologist with the Maine Audubon Society. And we met because Maine Audubon does a ton of lead-free fishing education. They do tackle exchanges. And they hit us for lead free tackle folks up for some stuff. They buy it, but we send them some stuff. We give them some nice discounts too, because we want to help them do as much educating and help them with their uh, efforts as much as we can. But that's how I got to know Laura. And just back and forth through the email, I was like, we got to get this young lady on this show. So without further ado, hello, Laura Williams. How are you doing this morning? Doing pretty good. Uh, had a really great weekend and collected a lot of lead. Got over 30 pounds from the sportsman show up in Augusta. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, that's 30 pounds that won't be ending up in the water, contaminating the water, or getting eaten by wildlife. That is absolutely spectacular. You know, I'm going to just start this off with super basic 101 questions. I don't know anything about you, and I know that a lot of our listeners will want this backstory because I'm telling you, this is a fish nurse. So about a third of our listeners don't even fish. They're, they're in for these kind of stories. They want to hear about the wildlife. They want to hear about the biology. They want to hear about fish where our motto is fish, fishing and eating fish. Well, this is all about fish and how, and the birds that uh, they share the ecosystem with and how us going fishing uh, one thing affects the other. But right now let's just start off with some one-on-one questions and get some backstory in and then we'll kind of zero in on that lead-free uh fishing topic all right here we go basic basic when did you know the outdoor life was for you well pretty much ever since i was a little kid um i was growing up and loved being outside i i grew up in the suburbs of massachusetts but my family would always spend weekends and summers vacationing to maine we had a property up in Farmington with about 40 acres of land, and it was the best playground as a kid. I was that weirdo little kid, and I had a bug box, and I would just run around all day catching any critters I could get my hands on. Bugs, frogs, chipmunks, snakes, really just about anything. And my curiosity grew for the outdoors, and I knew that it would be a way of life for me. Well, we are definitely kindred spirits. Take that back many, many years. And I was that same little kid running around doing the exact same thing. Snakes and, and frogs and stuff like that were my main focus. But uh, because I hung around the water a lot, 
Uh, but I know exactly where you're coming from. Uh, both of us, once you're hooked by the wild, once you feel the call of the wild, you just can't go back, can you? <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> Okay. Now, one of the things I really like about you, one of the things that makes me be real partial to a person right off the bat is you like to fish. So tell us who taught you how to fish. Well, my dad taught me how to fish and I've been hooked ever since. He was always a early morning type of guy and we'd wake up right as the sun came up, jump on the boat and head out fishing. Uh, one, one great story. When I, was, when I was a little kid, I was still sporting one of those push button rods and I somehow, who knows how, but I pushed the button in, went to cast and chucked my rod in the water, leaving the lure in the boat. And sure enough, that thing sunk to the bottom. And my dad had spent the day before relining everyone's reels. And so he had to pull all of the line up onto the boat bottom. And luckily we got my pole back, but we, me and my dad, we've had some good times fishing, including some epic fishing stories from Alaska, but I could, I could talk all day about fish stories. <laughs> I hear that. I hear that. I always warn people, you know, if you start talking about fishing, you better be ready to back away when, and even when I see your eyes glaze, glaze over, I'm going to just keep on going. Well, <laughs> your daddy sounds just wonderful. Like a patient, patient man that knew about teaching young people to fish. You don't, you don't, you just deal with it. You just deal with it. If you're out there to to fish you should have gone by yourself because you're out there to help somebody learn well then that's got to be your focus it sounds like a wonderful experience and uh yeah one of these days we're gonna get together we're gonna tell some more of those stories but oh absolutely <laughs> all right so let's move on laura grows up and what made you decide to become a wildlife biologist well i've always known that i've wanted to work outside so when it came time to apply for college i was scheming on how to make that happen um, I found Unity College in Maine, which was an entire college with majors dedicated to the environment and working outdoors. I've also always loved animals. So what better way to combine the two favorite things that I have to become a wildlife biologist? And I've I've had some of the coolest jobs ever. I've I've worked in Alaska, flying around in helicopters and bush planes, bushwhacking through some of the nastiest terrain you can think of. And counting shorebirds up there, mist netting and tagging and tracking bats. And then when I moved back to Maine, I got to work on a really cool project in the North Maine woods, capturing, collaring and tracking deer. All right. Now, look, I'm going to try not to divert too much, but I've got to know. And I'm sure the listeners are going, what the heck? What is mist netting? Mist netting is where you put up this thin, fine net um, in the woods. You find a a spot where you think the bats are flying through and you trap at night and you put up this net and basically the bats fly through the flyway. They get caught in the net. You stand up on a ladder or you pull the net down slowly. And then with wearing gloves, you uh, untangle the bats and then you hold them gently and we would attach radio transmitters to them and then be able to track them for about a month or so. Wow. That's really cool. That must be some sort of fine net that they can't uh feel it on their sonar or can't uh, figure out that it's there yeah yeah it's very very thin and um it doesn't harm them in any any way either fantastic fantastic all right so back on track back on track i want to know what's laura williams up to these days what sort of projects they got you working over there at uh, maine audubon well after all my adventures i came back and i'm a biologist at maine audubon and the best part is i get to work on many of our different conservation projects and know a little bit about everything you know and so the reason i came back and found maine audubon is the coastal birds project and this will be my fifth season working on that and we work to protect our endangered beach nesting birds the piping plovers and least terns on just about 20 beaches throughout Southern Maine. And we partner with multiple agencies and towns, as well as private landowners. We got lots of volunteers out there helping us protect nesting habitat. And we always say the job isn't just walking on the beach in the sun, but it's it's definitely a perk. And my other, my other big project is our Fish Led Free initiative. The reason we're here chatting today and through that project, I educate anglers about Maine's lead tackle law, encourage them to use lead-free alternatives, and provide them with lead recycling options as well. And some of the other projects at Maine Audubon I get to help out on are the Loon Count, Loon Restoration Project, Stream Smart, and Stream Explorers, to name a few. All right. Well, 
that just sounds wonderful. Thank you very much. I mean, it's, it's always a pleasure to meet someone who's on the front lines, who's out there trying to protect what we have, uh, enhance what's doing well, protect what needs to be protected, and helping to restore what has been damaged by uh, intrusion or extraction or anything else. So you sound like you're one busy lady keeping us in uh, wildlife and teaching people how to take care of their ecosystems and be good outdoor citizens. All right. Now you've, you've, you've opened the door. You talked about <laughs> the lead free fishing initiative and the only reason we got a lead free. Well, not the only reason, but the main reason the poster child for lead free fishing is the loon. Now, I know that Massachusetts led the way and passed their law in 1998, but take me through. You told me that Maine sort of uh, did a thing where they they scaled up. They scaled it up and they went layer by layer. Talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah. So we started in 2013. That's when the first ban came out and it was on small size lead sinkers. So anything two and a half inches or less or less than one ounce. And so that banned the sale and use of lead sinkers. And then come 2016, we we passed a ban on the sale of bare lead jigs. Um, so those are unpainted lead jig heads. And that's two and a half inches or less or less than one ounce in weight. And then come 2017, we banned the use of those bare jigs. All right. All right. All right. Well, we're going to come back to the to the jig head thing here in a minute, but when people hear what I'm up to with my company and my ideas for changing the way we fish, they talk to me about, uh, oh, is lead really a problem? Um, you know, is this really going on? Well, can you tell the folks about loon recovery in Maine and describe the positive causal relationship between restricting lead use in angling and loon survival? Well, loons, loons are doing pretty stellar in Maine. So we have about over 3,000 adult loons that breed on our lakes and ponds throughout the state. And lead poisoning was the leading cause of death before that 2013 ban on those small size lead sinkers. And now, 10 years after starting to restrict those sizes of small lead in our inland waters, lead poisoning has dropped to the third le leading cause. Um, I would like to point out, though, that our top cause of death right now is trauma from boat strikes. And this is another human-related issue that can be reduced just by raising awareness to boaters, knowing not to chase loons, back away from them and their chicks, uh, go slow within 200 feet of shore so your boat wake doesn't wash over their nests, and also remember to go slow at night because it's dark out and you can't see the loons in front of you. And that's just a general safety issue altogether. <laughs> yeah, well, and it, it's... It, it pays to see that this is all an integrated thing. I mean, the, the lead poisoning, be, be glad. It's one of those races where you're glad to, to, to drop down in the rankings rather than, than go up. I'm glad the lead poisoning is down from number one to number three. Hopefully we can get it down to, to 10 to inconsequential here before too long. So you're talking a lot then about behaviors, behaviors from boaters. And then of course, anglers, a lot of us use boats, but speaking of angling, what sort of fishing is the most detrimental to loons? Is it bass fishing, fly fishing, finesse, ultralight fishing? Talk to me about fishing and, and loons. Well, I mean, fishing and loons don't need to be mutually exclusive. There's many ways for us anglers to still enjoy fishing while allowing the loons to do their thing at the same time. The best way to know to let this happen is know some basic loon behavior and distress signs. So a lot of the time you won't know that there's a nest or a chick nearby your favorite fishing spot, but typically the loons will let you know if you know what to look out for. So three sure signs that you're too close and need to back away are the penguin dance, warning calls, or if the loons crouched on their nest. So the penguin dance is something that most people have seen, and it's, it's exactly what it sounds. So a loon rears up in the water and rapidly paddles the water with their feet and either outstretches their wings or tucks them in close. And they're basically standing up and moving towards you. The Their loud yodel or tremolo laughing calls are loons telling us that we're too close and need to back away. So typically, if I'm tucked into a little cove and notice a loon enter as I'm fishing, I'll reel in my line, move to another good spot, and let the loon take over the fishing. There's plenty of lake and fish for both us anglers and the loons. Well, amen to that. Amen to that. And and it's good to to let people know because I'm hoping to come up there in August and check some stuff out with you. And it'll be my first time to Maine. 
And I want to know if I'm upsetting these loons for sure. On the other hand, it's a lot of common sense, right? It's like, that, that loon's doing the penguin dance. It's coming toward me and stuff. It's not because it wants to make friends, all right? This ain't no Pixar movie, okay? <laughs> yeah, you know, no, that, it's that not that coming animal. over to hang out with you. It's telling yeah, you, get yeah, out of my spot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's saying, you know, he, she's saying, this is this is how they scare off other predators. This is how they scare off other danger. And uh, the thing is, if, if an animal is reacting to you in any way, it's probably a wild animal. It's probably not a good idea to encourage this interaction because your your point of view on it and their point of view are going to be completely different okay now we talk a lot about loons but i have a feeling there's a lot of other birds that benefit from eliminating this lead litter in aquatic environments uh what other birds are benefiting from this lots of other birds other fish eating birds like mergansers and cormorants can also ingest lead tackle if the fish that they eat has a hook in it from a broken fishing line um, eagles are another big one that people think of. There's lots of research out there showing that eagles are dying from lead poisoning. Now, that isn't solely due to lead poisoning from fishing tackle, um, but it, it 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 is a part of it. Other ways eagles get exposed to lead is scavenging carcasses that have been shot with lead, but that's that's a whole other big issue that we won't dive into today. <laughs> Good, good deal. Got to stay on the straight road here. It's, it's a big topic. And um, I, I have found that hunters and anglers are our bi biggest conservation advocates that really want to do the right thing. And so I know things are moving in the right direction to lessen lead in the environment, and we're doing all we can do. Well, your assumption is backed up by, for example, the Teddy Roosevelt Conservancy, which has done a study, one of which I read, 92% People that hunt and fish are big time in favor of conservation, big time wanting to enhance the existing environments, get more environments protected. A lot of us, even across the political lines, even in this day and age, are in agreement on this particular subject. We need to take care of what we got. We need to enhance what we've got, and we need to get as much as we can and protect as much as we can. And we want to take care of the animals that are under our protection, that are under our watch, because Sure, we can go out there and interact, but we have to do it with a sensitivity, with an intelligence, with a generosity of spirit and a sporting attitude. And so I find that all over this great country, we have people that are way onto this. I'm not going to fish with lead. And we're going to talk about that probably in another interview or another time. But it's mm -hmm. encouraging that, that you feel the same way and you're, you're seeing that go on. Um, I want to throw in a couple of my own that I've in my research. I'll tell you another big one is swans. We we don't have many in Kansas, but I the way I hear it, Michigan and Minnesota, a lot of their lead free folk up there, are not just both, they got loons too. Mm -hmm. They've got these these swan populations that they're out to protect. And and my thing is even ducks and stuff, anything that's going to be protected by the anti lead shot. Uh, yeah, and it's just about everything that will be protected by that. You know, it's yeah. better for the wildlife it's better for the water it's better for us you know it is better for us it is better for us um i can't point to any research where lead prevalence is so high from fishing that it's actually contaminating a drinking water lake but i do notice that up in the northeast at least like in new york and massachusetts and i'm hoping to get familiar with maine but the, a lot of the drinking water lakes have restrictions on boating fishing all kinds of things to keep contaminants out of the water. Now that, that just makes sense to me. I don't really want to meet the person that says, Oh, hell no. I want gas and lead and all kinds of stuff in my water. That's that, you know, that's what makes it taste good. Uh, <laughs> and that's what keeps these bright thoughts moving through this brain. Um, so when we talk about animals, you know, picking this up, we're going to talk about two types of ingestion. We're going to talk about incidental, which is when they pick it up, when they're going for grit, when they pick it up because they eat a fish or something that has a lead object in it. And and I'm, I'm not going to divert this, but hooks also can cause mm -hmm. exceeding amount of problems. I mean, stick a hook in your lip and see how hard it is to get out. And uh, especially songbirds, when we tangle line up in a tree and it still has a worm on that hook, it's just enough to break your heart to see a robin or a cardinal that's falling a fallow. That, that set up. But so that would be purposeful ingestion. So we, we got incidental where they pick it up by accident. Then they're going to take whatever bait is left over on that line. They're going to take that lure. That lure is meant to fool a fish into thinking it's food. So why wouldn't a fool a bird, right? It, it, they just, Absolutely. They do it yeah. Purposely. So it's, 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 it's a, it's a, a double-edged thing. And that's why we've got to be real careful with this stuff and do our best to recover 
tackle when it gets hung up. Okay. So this kind of leads me back to where I was going with the types of fishing. Mm -hmm. And and one of the reasons I got into this lead free game is because I'm an ultralight fisher. I like to fish for panfish, crappies. I like to finesse fish for bass. I like to do the light tackle bass fishing. And, And in my estimation, we're the biggest troublemakers because we're the ones using the small lures. Yes. We use cheap lures. Uh, so some people who aren't a sporting will just say to heck with it and just bust it rather than try to recover it. We well, use, and another we have, thing to note um, for bass fishing is you bass fishermen use a lot of soft plastics. And yes. those can be pretty bad for our fish as well. If you're losing those in the lake, the fish will pick those up and then it just swells right up in their stomach and stays in there. But Lots can be done on that matter where if if your soft plastic starts to rip, you pay attention a little bit, swap it out for a new one. Never just chuck it in the lake to get rid of it. Always take it home with you and throw it away. Right, right. Very simple stuff. And and we can talk about that another time. I'm, I'm going to go a short way down that road. Then I'm going to get right back on the main road. So everybody, <laughs> everybody hang on. But I can't. We, we talked about this. I used to have a podcast called Lure Love. And we talk about you know, what we can do because there are two basic types. There's plastisol, which tends to be the weaker one, tends to be the, the, the one that gets lost the most. And then there's elastomers, which is a lot tougher, more of a silicone type uh, plastic. They both do swell up though. They both are bad in a fish's uh, gut. The only thing about elastomer is it's 10 to 20 times more durable than, than your, your plastisol. But you can buy plastisol glue. You can take a little lighter. You can kind of melt it back together or you, yeah, you, or you just change it out. We can't help losing a thing or two. And I don't want to add the plastics because we're getting enough help from people who don't fish, who can't seem to quit throwing their plastic bottles and or throwing the lid from their plastic bottle or this or that in the lake. And things like gloves and drink lids and things like that are also ingested and mistaken for food by a lot of birds and animals, both on the maritime environment and in the freshwater environment. Absolutely. Um, and and as you mentioned, there's plenty of ways out there to secure your soft plastics and and still fish with them and not lose them as often, you know. Absolutely. And and just because there's bigger centers in the world doesn't make it so okay for us to go along, you know, la dee da, I just don't care. And and like we say, we're only talking to that five to ten percent that just won't give up on the illusion that they can't possibly hurt the environment with what they're doing. Well, it's not the individual so much as the collective, although there are certain types of individuals that seem to want to be outstanding in their negative behavior. And uh, we won't we won't get off on a rant like that because I can already feel my water starting to boil and we, we don't need that. So you're saying, you know, the small size, the way we size this, and I love how Maine does it with measurement. We're, mm-hmm. we're going to go measurement. We're going to go ounce. We're going to. And although I guess they just had the loon conservancy in New Hampshire or one of the loon scientists down in New Hampshire, they just picked up one that had like a one and a half or two ounce in it you know and that and that animal of course died i know that's why i'm just hoping we can go for a kind of a total thing because you know right now we're doing what we need to do and we can point to the research that it does work yeah Um, well and it's those it's those small sizes that we typically see loons mistaking for grit on the bottom and they'll pick up as gravel but those larger sizes are typically when they're eating a fish that already has a lure in it so we do i mean we do still see those large sizes of lead but it's the small sizes that are the big, big issue. and Right, right. Because that, like I say, the more lures, more people using the lures, lighter line. That's another problem with it. Beginners, we always start the kids out on the little trouts and the little perch and the little sunnies. And, and so they're, they're getting snagged up. We've got to be cognizant of it at all times. Like, for example, I know a lot of guys are switching to iron or zinc downrigger weights. Now, you're probably going to lose a downrigger weight maybe once or twice in a lifetime. But they just feel better about it if they lose one made out of zinc, which is actually something i guess you can eat in vitamins (laughs) rather than one that's made out of lead and i think that's that's really cool okay now laura i want to get back the one thing that irritates the living heck out of me about when i rank the the lead free laws massachusetts is the most straightforward and strict and then i think probably new hampshire new york is kind of the loose kind of gutted you're allowed to have it. You're just not allowed to sell it, which is, is kind of crazy to me. But the main loophole is, I don't know how they got this. Well, it's called compromise. And in political compromise, you start out wanting a pony and you end up something like a Bactrian camel by the time everybody's done. And they so this loophole says in Maine, if you use a painted jig head, you can use a lead jig head. Now, is there any science behind that that says that makes it any safer? So, yeah, in truth, there's there's no science behind that that makes it any safer. That paint, I mean, it it easily chips off. I think it's more of a 
it makes us think it's safer. You know, they kind of trick us into, oh, if there's paint on it, it's okay. But that paint, I mean, it chips off in your tackle box after a few casts as you're bouncing it off the bottom, you start losing paint. And let alone the effects of a loon's gizzard with the rock tumbler, tumbler effect and the pH levels in there, that paint wears down in minimum a week and they still have lead in their stomach. They're still going to get sick from lead poisoning and die from it. Well, that's what I thought you'd say. And as far as that loon gizzard goes, yeah, you should have seen what happened to magic school bus when they tried to go down through there. I mean, that, that isn't going to protect nothing. They can, they can chip that, that lead all the way up. And you hear y'all, she's talking just like a fisher, right? She knows you go bound. I don't care how fancy dancy your paint job is on your lead head if you go rock rock hopping bouncing that on the rocks and so forth it's going to start to chip off and yeah cheaper paint jobs we a lot of guys are doing the best they can to have most durable paint jobs because that's what what fishers expect but i've seen base uh age coatings and so forth they still they'll still give it up and really uh, the the gizzard on a bird is it's just a big old tough muscle that that can it's there to grind up grain and seeds and and whatnot bones and such so it's yeah. gonna it's gonna chip that that lead right off there. So hopefully y'all can keep after. I guess you told me that uh, you're gonna kind of start down that direction and see if we can't get the legislature to wake up and go ahead and ban those. Yeah, right now uh, Maine Audubon is working to close that loophole, and it would be similar to the rollout of the bare lead jigs, where it'll be a three year phase out. We'll stop the sale of it, and then we'll stop the use of it. And so that's. That's up for legislation right now, and hopefully things will go well with that. Well, hopefully, and I like the common sense approach there. Don't just drop this right on people out of nowhere. Give them a chance to give the the people that are selling, give them a chance to get rid of their stock and and get the anglers a chance to get things right with their tackle box. Because I don't much care to get on people anyway, but until companies like mine can provide you with exactly what you want in a lead-free form in a, in an easy way to get it. God, people got to fish. We just got to fish. Am I right or am I wrong, Laura? We just got to fish. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. I mean, we're going to keep fishing. So we got to find the, the right way to do it and the way to keep the environment safe. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Now here's something I read the other day, because there's always people and, and bless their little hearts. There's always people that want to play devil's advocate, no matter what. And, um, there's that group that says, oh, the earth is trash. Let's just forget it. Party, have fun, let it blow up and to hell with future <laughs> generations. Uh, I'm not necessarily on that boat. Uh, I'd kind of like to see that boat catch fire and sink in the ocean, but that's just me. Um, so here we are. Somebody telling me, oh, it just don't matter because global warming loons are all going to move to Canada. And it won't even matter anyhow. I think the one that's getting poisoned today would argue against that if the loons could have a voice. I know if I was a loon, I'd be like, well, even if I'm going to be gone in 30 years, what about today? But anyway, we're, are we going to lose our loons? Are we going to lose our population? Is global warming going to take these fine birds away from us? I mean, the, the hope is that we start doing the right thing and we can, we can make some changes. But currently on the track that we're on, National Audubon predicts by 2080, if the temperature warms by three degrees Celsius, that loons will no longer have the right conditions to breed in the lower 48 at all. Um, they'll still come down and overwinter along Maine's coast, but they they may not be able to adapt to the new conditions. And those conditions, the if if things warm, we'll get changes in temperature, and that can affect their food sources. Uh, they also it'll affect water quality with more algae blooms. It'll be difficult for loons to see their prey that they hunt underwater, and. Hotter days mean they need to pant more to cool off while sitting on their nests, and that makes them susceptible to more biting insects. And we're also seeing a big spread of respiratory diseases and other pathogens that could be associated with a warmer climate. There is a lot and lot and lot of research that is showing that, yes, the the, the microstructure is changing and being uh, the, the graph is changing and we're seeing bumps in places or bigger bumps in places than previously. And we're tying that to a warmer climate that is for sure once again a whole nother podcast we'd have to get we have doc martin our freshwater ecologist we get her in on this stuff because she does tons and tons of water purity studies and all kinds of stuff in her job and i know she can chime in on this you know and that's just it it's only like one or two more degrees but to a fish that's a lot just a little fella down there and uh it it, it just you know yeah they can survive it but they're not thriving like they used to they're not they're not living the life that their forefathers, their generations previous. 
Yeah, the life that they're accustomed to and the the um, habitat that they're supposed to be in. Yeah, and that their body is set up to take, we're all set up to take X number of pathogen attacks, but at a certain rate. And if that rate increases, that increases our chance of getting sick. But we'll get some get some out. Uh, maybe we're going to have to have you back. I can see about a half a dozen in things in here. We're just going to have to have you back. That's all there is to it. Yeah, so um, we can dig in a little deeper. <laughs> dig in a little deeper, geek out a little more, because that's what this podcast is all about. We are the fish nerds. All right. I want to know about tackle exchanges because I've been I've given to several of them. I do work for several of them, both paid and, and donation, but I never been to one and I don't exactly know how it goes on. So I show up, I've got a hundred split shot, uh, three dozen crappie jigs and five lead spoons. I want to turn in. So how does it work? I say, here you go. Here's my lead. What are you going to give me? Well, so the way it works is you can either choose from the tackle options that we have on hand. So stuff from glass water angling that runs John- out first. Well, <laughs> that's awful nice. I had a feeling. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So anything from glass water angling that we have from you, we have some other dealers that we get tackle from. And so if any of that stuff, they like that, they can, they can grab that in exchange, usually give them a couple lures, some some split shots, some jigs, um, or they can get a $10 voucher to our participating retailers. And we have four of those throughout the state and we're always looking for more. So if anyone's listening and has a main tackle shop, give me a ring and we'll get you set up on the program. But yeah, I mean, I, I collect the lead. I've done it at ice fishing derbies. I did the sportsman shows. We'll do it for lake associations if they're having an annual meeting um, at boat launches that are busy. And the biggest thing is, is to get the word out ahead of time because people, if they don't know to bring their lead, they're not going to bring their lead in. So it, um, it, it's a really great program and it, it helps for anglers to test out these lead free alternatives before they actually have to make the investment. Okay. So I, I absolutely love this because this is my pillars. When I do my public speaking is if we're going to compete with lead. We got to do it on lead's terms. So we've got to make it effective. We've got to make it within a price point that they folks can live with. And mostly we got to make it available and through your wonderful program and, and others like it, this gives a low risk way for people to say, Hey, you know, come on, this bismuth alloy jig, I just caught, you know, 15 inch crappie. It, it's working even better than that lead stuff, you know, or whatever, but it gives them a chance, a nice risk-free chance to, to try it. And then you get to de- tell them, you know, exactly what the law is and so forth. Because what I've been led to understand by my friends up in the Northeast is these Rangers don't have like little test strips they are going to set on your lure or set on your sinkers or any of the rest of it. We're just, this is just kind of like, you're going to obey the law. You're not going to obey, obey the law. Are you going to go along with what makes sense and what people have agreed on, or are you just going to go on with your own and, self-centered approach? And that's uh, very true. I mean, the, the wardens in Maine, they have so much work to do. They're not, they're not necessarily going around looking at every little piece of tackle in your tackle box. You know, they're, they're out there keeping the the wildlife safe and keeping boaters safe and whatnot. So it's it's definitely on the anglers to to do the right thing and not use those small sizes of lead. Well, it seems like all the anglers, I will say all, but I'm really proud and impressed the number of anglers that uh, are doing it because we've just seen the loons just go up, up, up in every state that does this, even New York, you know, and when, when it started working out so well for Massachusetts, the other states started seeing a, a small rise in their loon population. So they said, Hey, why not? And so it took on, and now you've got five states up there that are banning lead, restricting lead. And that's awesome. 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 Mm-hmm. Now talk to me about the future of lead free fishing. I like what you say about education, because I do some stuff with the Minnesota pollution control agency. Mm-hmm. And they have a big lead-free fishing program as part of their agenda. And it's nice that, that they have that. And Minnesota's decided against legislation, they're going to just depend on education. But how do you see it? And how does Audubon see it? What is the future of lead-free fishing for you? And what would you like most to see? Well, lead-free fishing is becoming more accessible and more popular. I mean, The more people that know about it and understand why the ban is in place and why we're doing it, the more people that get on board. And so my take is that education is the best both short and long-term solution. 
Um, the more that people understand those effects that it has on the wildlife, the environment, and even ourselves, the more likely they are to make the switch to lead-free tackle. All I can say is you're holding up your end. I have a different take on, on the future, but it depends on education. All right. It depends on education. And I'm not going to uh, talk about it because this interview isn't about me and my deal. And I think while well, the nerds already know what it is, uh, but yes, we got to have the education both out front and backing us up. And we've got to have scientists like you saying, yeah, really, it's not, uh, this isn't flat earth society. This is real. All right. This is <laughs> not something we're doing just to pick on you to make you spend more money on tackle either we're we're doing it because it makes sense it's reasonable and if we all get together on this i think we're going to find that it's not as painful as a lot of these i'm not going to say cry babies wait did i just say cry babies <laughs> it's not as, as as painful as a lot of these people make out i mean if we're looking at a 10 percent difference in price you know it's like come on just just eat it and a lot of times these lead-free companies are actually just saying hey we're just gonna make a little less money because i know the materials can be more expensive but if we buy smart. We do this. We do that. It's a little more challenging to be a lead-free tackle uh, supplier and designer, but my gosh, it's a lot of fun because every time you come up with a new idea, you know, you just save a whole bunch of critters and a whole bunch of birds and, and, and it really feels good. All righty. Yeah. Well, I think we've gotten through the question list. I'm going to give you final word. You can take all the time you want. Yeah. Yeah. So as a final parting word, um, as loons and other wildlife continue to face a plethora of threats to their survival, such as loss of habitat, pollution and contamination, and changing temperatures and food sources, reducing the threat of lead poisoning from lead tackle is one proactive thing we can do right now to help our loons thrive. So it's it's a simple thing to do. It's an easy switch to make. If you go to a company's website like Glasswater Angling, he's got great lead-free tackle and just about everything you can think of. Well, thank you very much for that. And you are absolutely right. And it makes you feel good. It really does. I've been fishing lead three since 2011. And I'm telling you, I don't notice any difference. Well, this is what I like to hear is small proactive things that people can do. And this is certainly one of them. It's so daunting to think, Oh, I've got, you know, these problems seem so huge, but if we just, you just chip, chip, chip away and like that Bob Marley song, small ax, you know, you, it's a big tree, but, but we just keep working on it. And eventually all of a sudden out of nowhere, that whole thing changes and uh, we can get there, we can get there, but there's nothing better for me as a sportsman, as an angler to think, well, I did have to break that off, but gosh, darn it at least it's lead free and at least it's not going to add contaminants to the water and it's not going to hurt nothing that eats it. All right. Well, Laura, it has been an absolute pleasure to get with you this morning. I've been anxiously awaiting this moment and it has finally arrived. I appreciate you coming on the show. Yeah. Yeah. It was great chatting with you and hopefully we can do another show sometime soon. All right. But I know you're going to be off monitoring those birds for a while. So you just tell me when you've got a gap in your schedule and I'll come and get you and we'll, we'll talk about some other stuff. All right. Yeah, definitely. Looking forward to catching some fish this summer too. Heck yes. Heck yes. All <laughs> right. Now you're talking my language. All righty. This is crappie hippie. Your tree hugging redneck from Eastern Kansas with wildlife biologist, Laura Williams from the Maine Audubon society talking about lead free fishing. Get with that lead free, get the tox out of your box, do that proactive thing to help the environment. And above all, Get out there and get some fish caught, y'all. Tight lines and valentines. Peace out. Well, doesn't that make you want to fish lead free or what? It, you know, John, I always want to fish lead free, but this kind of sears it up. You know how it's like, you get that kind of like uh, confirmation of what you're doing. It's good. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'll tell you, I've been donating to these things and I'm glad I finally got the skinny on exactly what, how it's done and, and what they're doing. I, I just, like I say, I had her scheduled for 10, 15 minutes, but we just, couldn't help it. We had such a fun time. We just kept on rolling. Yeah, I should, and I should reach out to uh, Chef Jamie as well because I live an hour away from the Salt Yard restaurant, and I I love a rooftop bar. So I should stop by there and uh, and check it out and say hi as well. Absolutely, you should. Although, like every head chef, he'll be a quick hello because this young man is busy, 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 That's busy. Right. And I think I'll have drinks. Laura, Laura had to yeah. twist on his arm a bit, <laughs> get him to send that to us. But do it. Please do it. You do it. Listeners, go do it. It sounds like a wonderful place. I've read the reviews, and it's a swanky hotel. It's the Canopy Hotel in Portland, Maine, the Salt Yard Restaurant, and the Luna Rooftop 
Roof tarp. Roof tarp. That's that the best kind of that, tarp. Yeah. yeah. All right. It well, is indeed. You got okay. it, John. Hey, John, talk about a little bit about your lead-free company so people can buy your lures. Uh, I am the co-founder and chief cook and bottle washer at Glasswater Angling at glasswaterangling.com. We sell biz jig, bismuth alloy jig heads. We have our own uh, bismuth alloy that we make ourselves for that. And it, so it can be powder painted and it, and it works out really, really well. We have our own original lures. One is called Angle King. The other is called Crappie Doula. I love they the are Crappie dope. Doulers. I love yeah, them. The Doodler. Yeah, the yeah. Doodler is fabulous. It's a double underspin. So is Angle King. Um, and we do some other stuff, too. We've got uh, some slick weights. Uh, we've got the lead-free split shot. Um, I do some hand-tied jigs, all kinds of stuff like that. Well, of course, we have apparel and all that. And anyway, get on over to glasswaterangling.com. I will tell you one product that we just introduced, and I am super stoked about it. We've got lead-free Ned heads, the original shroom style no. Ned heads with an offset wide gap hook. So you can keep it weedless, throw it into those weeds, throw it into that brush. You don't have an open hook set up on your net hood on your net head that is going to snag up or get in those algae drifts and just turn into a giant ball of green mush. Um, yeah, get on over and get yourself some Ned head with uh lead free net heads from us. Uh, we just introduced them and we have them in size one, one on and two off. Oh, I love that because all the, when you buy the Ned rigs from what's the company name that makes them neds uh it's oh z-man is z-man the, one the official they yeah. only sell lead with those and i i contacted them and they weren't they weren't into uh doing lead free yet so i'm glad you're doing it that's great news john again your website people can go there what's it again glasswaterangling.com and you can get a hold of me at information at glasswaterangling.com yep and now uh just kind of plug here with the fish nerds we are making a little attempt to make just a little bit of uh a little bit of money for the podcast. We need to upgrade our equipment. I need a brand new computer. My computer here is barely functional. And so if you have a company and you want to advertise on the Fish Nerds right now for the for the summer, $25 per episode. I'll give you a 30-second ad read. Probably get a little more than that with it, maybe a minute. But like $25, whatever your gear is, whatever your, your business is, you know, as long as it's friendly, we will get you on air and uh, help you make a little bit of money and help us get where we need to be with getting our equipment upgraded. I also want to get some uh, more microphones out to some more correspondence as well. So a little money in the bank will make a big difference. Speaking of which, I do want to thank the Patreon subscribers. John, I've been neglecting them and they deserve a bigger thank yous than I've been giving. So I will make it a point next week or so to reach out to our Patreon subscribers and thank them for in person or in, individually for what they Individually, let's thank them. But I'll tell you what, why don't you get in there? tonight after we're done doing this and you grab two or three names on out of there and we'll give each of them a $25 uh, prize from the glass water angling prize stash. All right. That sounds great, John. That's pretty, pretty, pretty generous of you. <laughs> so, and we'll, well be generous. To you. They're generous folks and we can't do this without them. And there, so. there are some who've been with us for years, years uh, indeed. Uh, yeah. And I want to get back on. They've got to update the whole website. I haven't even, haven't logged on Patreon in months. So I've been neglecting and, my apologies. My life is crazy about teenagers, and my brain feels like it's always about to explode, and I just never, never get around to it. Yeah, I know the feeling, man. I know the yeah, feeling. Yeah, but the reality is. All right, let's wrap this show up, John. You've listened to two fish nerds, well, more than two, a whole bunch of fish nerds when you should have been fishing. Big special thanks. We've got to thank Angie Scott from the Women Angler Adventure Podcast, Laura Williams from Maine Audubon. Got to thank... Uh, Jamie Moffat, right? From uh, from, from the, the Canopy Hotel, the, yeah, the Salt roof, Yard Restaurant. Roof Tarp. And the Rooftop, <laughs> the Luna, the Rooftop Restaurant and Bar. Rooftop Restaurant and Bar. Big thanks to uh, Original Music. I mean, how cool is it, John? Let me have a fishing podcast and our theme music's all original. Mysterious Bait Caster Cylinder, who was maybe promised to never speak his name out loud. Diana's Bath Salts, local band here in North Conway, and Wally Pleasant doing our theme song. Big thanks to that's so so wild to have original music here. So it's until, fabulous. It's just great. Yes. Yeah, so until next time, John. Follow well, wait a minute. Don't forget about what? Michael LaFort and Tim Tackabox Beat for sending us in some fabulous news stories. Had to throw those guys in too, brother. Oh, I forget things, John. It's been a long show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you bring us out of this show. You end it. All righty. Remember the code of the fish nerds. Right. Never whoops. <laughs> Spawn early and often, John. <laughs>
Never take a free lunch with strings attached. And swim against the current every chance you get. Done. We're done. You're fly fishing in a stream, getting those ankles wet. (laughs) We're deep in the ocean, casting nets. Fish nerds. Fish nerds. Fish nerds. It's a podcast. Just for the hell of it. Fried in a basket or broiled in a pan. Eat it raw like you're in Siam. Fish nerds. Fish nerds. Fish nerds. It's a podcast. We did it, John. We done done it. All right.